<clears throat> the religious folk songs of my people have become concert fair and sometimes museum pieces. Yet it would seem to me that only in finding our way back to the simple truth to which these human documents testify, can we find the key to the spirit inherent in them. By lending our ear to the continuity and perseverance, we may find the heart string of their meaning, with which lives the meaning of the words of Christ. The choices of faith, the acceptance of a spiritual reality, where but the wise choice of a people who, without the benefit of a philosophic tradition, recognize the all-encompassing human and divine wholeness of truth. I ask myself, what did I know of myself? of my people. Well, here we are in America. Shreds and tatters of our ancient qualities still cling to us, even now. But what was the original fabric like? You see, I had originally intended to go to Africa and travel through the continent where my ancestors came from. I wanted to uh, identify with Africans and Africa. You see, my people found in the grandeur of the biblical word and poetry a fountain of illimitable solace. You see, the text of these folk songs are a blend of versified religious paraphrases and amplifying remarks of the poets. You see, the spirituals share basic human qualities, regardless of race, creed, or color. And they speak of that endless search for a better understanding of the divine law, the divine law which shapes the destinies of men. These Africans captured for the southern plantations brought with them many parts of Africa. Their various cultures, skills, and a creative power. These transplanted Africans fused their American experiences and then produced a new art, the Afro-American religious folk song, The Spiritual. <laughs> this collection, a brief anthology of what I call religious folk songs, uh, well, while compiling the 30 songs of this collection for general public interest, the three panels, or small anthologies, if you will, of 10 songs are well contrasted and diversified as to mood and key. 
One group describes events of the Old Testament. Another, the New Testament. Between these is a group in which I call abstractions from the, both the Old and the New Testament. They're based upon the teachings of the Bible more than the episodes from it. I believe that the second half of the New Testament group of songs is worthy of a place beside early European composers' efforts at the depiction of the passion of our Lord. Africa speaks to the world of art in this music. Just as I myself, the music was born a child of an American slave. But it is the inheritor of a true culture that's peculiar to Africa. These experiences from which they have sprung have been so much part of my life that the songs have become a part of me. You see, art forms and Afro-American folk songs do meet on the common ground of purpose, feeling, and fitting form. <laughs> and all three are amply demonstrated in my songs. And in that sense, they are my songs. You see, the roots of the songs of my people penetrate deep into the significance of the word of God. You see, the Bible is the source. And any interpretation deviating from this fact is the grossest of errors. If singing is to be really imaginative art. It must give off on each occasion the effect of a fresh creation in which mind and body act together. And fundamentally, these folk songs had three things in common. Rhythmic idiom, thus, and refrain. Claims have been advanced in recent years that Afro-American religious folk songs originated purely and simply in the slaves' imitation of their white master's hymns. If this is what is meant by the said advocators, an imitation claim, then I shall be quiet. Because it is a fact that the Afro-American, as do other folks, often blends related items of meanings with his own. But it certainly is not his practice to generally throw away many of his original possessions. A given dialect word can look ever so raw in print. Yet, when the meaning is properly caught, there is an immediate transformation. Therefore, Self-abnegation and complete subjection of the ego <laughs> are demanded of all who would sing. So, what takes place in the heart of a performer, 
unconsciously, often escapes the average listener whose rapt attention is engaged with the sensuous pleasures of listening. Oh, yes, I am convinced of that, particularly in the singing of spirituals by members of my own race. Therefore, many of the songs of this collection, for example, will be found in clicked vowels sandwiched in between English words. For instance, the song titled in that morning, expressed in dialect, in that morning, or in the song Dry Bones. They're going to walk around. The Afro-American originator expressed the same thought in dialect as, they gonna walk around. This language of our original ancestors must have possessed such a high frequency of vibrations that it became an effective medium of communication between nature, God, and themselves. <laughs> the rule of the correct phonetic sound, for example, of the letters D and E, is the same as that in the English language. When D and E together proceed a word that begins with a vowel, the letter E has the same sound as the E in the word B. And when preceded with a consonant, the E has the same sound as a uh in the word the. Not infrequently, I am asked, should Negro spirituals be sung in the crude, broad dialect which we hear spoken as well as sung? Hmm. Well, it must be remembered that my people sprang originally from many and varied tribal areas in Africa, as well as from many different American regions. You'll notice that the actual sound, as well as the blending of the words, as used by them, is quite different from the feeling conveyed by the same words seen in cold print. No, no, no one should attempt to use dialect in singing the songs of my people who has not beforehand thoroughly mastered the idiom of our master singers and the dialect itself. I see over-exaggerations as vulgarities and malfactions because they simply fail to reach the profound religious expression. The religious expression, which is the very hot beat of the Afro-American religious folk song. Spirituals. They are the spontaneous outburst of intense religious fervor. And their origins are chiefly found in camp meetings, revivals, and other religious exercises. It's a serious misconception of their meaning and value to treat them as comic songs. For through all these songs, there breathes a hope and a faith in the ultimate justice and brotherhood of man. Whether or not the singing of the folk songs of my people is effective, 
depends upon the proper approach. The proper approach of the individual or group who sings them. And it cannot be attained by a superficial survey. When my people wish to express something of marked characterization over other words, they want the terms they use to be substantial. Substantial in every part as to when immediate and favorable reactions. You see, I've learned how instrumental effects are sometimes implied in the vocal characteristics of the older Afro-American folk songs. Mm -hmm. You see, these and other studies I too have drawn upon even in some of my own accompaniments. You see, my people, they grasp the meaning of Christ's teachings, not only mirrored throughout their lives, but it is reflected in their songs. You may search this entire collection of Afro-American religious folk songs extant and you will not find one word of hate or malice anywhere expressed in them. First, one must realize that the inner significance of these songs stems from a universal human source that's common to all mankind. Next is to know that the music through an understanding of what the Afro-American's life situation is as against that of other individual races. In these simple, naive religious song poems may just live the germ for some future art form which, as with Bach and the Choral, achieve their typical grandiose expression to whoever hears them, but it's with simplicity of heart and reverence for their spiritual and human truths. You see, with me, the words come first. I study them, and when I am sure of the meaning of the poem, I tackle the music. You must realize that music is supposed to clothe the words, not to get between you and the words. You see, African songs give instruction often by allegory and improvised song with a topical episode or an emotion. Later, it was discovered to be emblematic, not of weakness or degradation under slavery, but of power which carried the race through slavery. <laughs> you see, this attitude helped. It helped to shape the astonishing growth intellectually and musically. When thinking of the most consequential African-American singers and musicians of the early 20th century, the names Louis Armstrong, Josephine Baker, Bessie Smith, and Paul Robeson justly come to mind. However, there is another less recognized artist whose career deserves to be considered by any serious students of those times, Roland Hayes. 
born on June 3, 1887 in Curryville, Georgia, less than a quarter of a century after the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Indeed, his parents were tenant farmers on the same plantation where Roland's mother had once been a slave. Now, despite facing tremendous political and economic inequality and disadvantages, Hayes would go on to become a world-renowned soloist and one of the greatest African-American pioneers to change the national music scene. <laughs> Personally, I believe Roland Hayes was the first male solo artist to perform domestic and international concert recitals as a vocal entrepreneur. He was respectively known as a trailblazer to influence a new format in concert programming, which included Negro folk songs, the spirituals. His interpretative singing was accompanied with such conviction that a reporter from the New York American stated, his renderings delighted even the connoisseurs and the spirituals fairly transported the entire audience. This statement clearly shares the remarkable talent displayed while in the presence of Roland Hayes. There were two sources of inspiration in which Hayes encountered as a young man that shaped the rest of his life. The first were the Negro folk songs which he learned and sang at Mount Zion Baptist Church in Curryville, Georgia, that his mother founded. The second was an introduction to European classical music from the phonograph recording of a famous Italian tenor, Enrico Caruso. The impression of these recordings that were exemplified by the talented and skilled art of Caruso's voice, confidence, and power spoke volumes of hope to Hayes' greatest musical desires. And when Hayes' family relocated to Chattanooga, Tennessee, he enrolled to study music at Fisk University, a historical black college in Nashville, Tennessee. And that's where he joined and began touring with the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Dreams are like power and some dreams pursued become fame. As luck would have it, Hayes was one of the fortunate dreamers to experience fame during his lifetime. Negro folk songs weren't viewed as popular in the mainstream music scene outside of African-American communities. But prior to his work, music of that genre was little heard of. Hayes felt it was his responsibility to not only seek out his dreams as a singer, but to also be an ambassador of change in the music world by introducing these songs to a wider audience. And likewise, with that dream came a great responsibility. The early 1900s was a pivotal time for African Americans. Racial oppression and segregation was broad across the United States. Despite all, there was a historical rebirth for many African Americans. <laughs> for instance, in the wake of this resurgence, Jamaican-born black nationalist leader Marcus Garvey and the founder of the UNIA Universal Negro Improvement Association was in the process of an international migration back to Africa movement. Contrary to this Garvey exodus, Hayes was one of the many African-American artists to migrate from the South to the urban North, seeking new opportunities in what was recognized as the Harlem Renaissance period. Other prominent figures throughout this movement included musicians Duke Ellington, poets Langston Hughes, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and writers James Weldon Johnson and Zora Neale Hurston. All 
Although Hayes was faced with unfortunate challenges, he was also presented with fortunate opportunities and a freedom of expression to reinvent himself. Intuitively, Hayes used his experience and business ethics from his years at Fisk University while touring with the Fisk Jubilee Singers. His Fisk years inspired him to take risk, and in doing so, he was able to launch his solo singing career. In one example, he spent $200 of his own money to rent out Boston's Jordan Hall for his first recital and he was credited as the first African-American soloist to appear with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Hayes incorporated the Negro spirituals of his youth into his performances and introduced that style of music to many listeners. This unconventional style found a receptive audience as Hayes embarked on a concert tour of several venues across the United States. In 1920, Hayes, accompanied by his pianist Lawrence Brown, traveled to London, where he performed at the Wigmore Hall in the presence of the members of the British royal family. In 1923, after his European tour, he would return to the United States where he would reside and work in Boston for the rest of his life. While pursuing my undergrad, studying voice at the University of the District of Columbia, I was first introduced to Hayes' music, his life, and his career, when a distant friend of mine by the name of Dr. William Garcia of Lincoln University sent me a songbook entitled 30 of My Favorite Spirituals. He suggested that I learn a song popularized by Hayes called Little Boy. I presented the songbook to my voice teacher, Nelda Ormond. She was familiar with Roland Hayes' music and his singing. In addition to Little Boy, she selected two other songs and suggested that I read up on Roland Hayes and his legacy. Intrigued, I decided to go on an excursion in order to learn more about him. Later, I became an enthusiast of the Roland Hayes story. And as a result, I was left in amazement by the wealth of knowledge of history and experience contained within this songbook. In addition to working with Miss Ormond, I was also privileged to work with another vocal coach by the name of Charlotte Wesley Holloman. When I decided to present selections from Hayes' songbook in a recital, Mrs. Holloman graciously coached me. Surprisingly, she also had a personal connection to Roland Hayes. Her father, Charles Wesley, who later became a scholar of African American history at Howard University, was a personal friend of Hayes. According to her, Roland Hayes would visit her home frequently. The relationship between Charles Wesley and Roland Hayes was very close, very much like brothers. Remarkably, they both attended Fisk University and were members of the Fisk Jubilee touring ensembles. Unlike other songbooks of spirituals, there was something special and uniquely different about this one. This collection was carefully constructed with noteworthy melody lines, historic insights, and details about the text as well as the music. Stylistically composed, these songs were arranged and fused as an Afro-Euro style that even today, spirituals are considered a classical crossover, bridging the gaps between African, European, and other genres that originated from within the United States. In most cases, Negro folk songs were either showcased in part, as in the second half of the program, or as an encore piece. Today, you'll find that various ethnicities are now including Negro folk songs in their classical recital programs.
although Hayes formatted these selections into three parts. However, for this production, 20 out of the 30 songs were selected in which I felt best conveyed Hayes' message and artistry. His passion for telling the history of the African diaspora through music is evident in these passages. Comparatively, I chose to turn the three sections into four with a slight alteration of a few songs in order to best narrate the chronological biblical story through music. Imagine if you will, you're attending a classical recital that involves art songs. This songbook production carries those same concepts by grouping a set of songs together with folklore poems and biblical texts. Creatively for this production, I envisioned the African rhythmic sounds of the drums as an additional voice. The very moment I realized the African connection, I was convinced. How could I speak or sing of Africa without the added percussion sounds? I have to admit, it was delightful to use early folk idioms Finally, all of the vocal arrangements of this production are sung with passion and interpreted with an intended commitment towards the urgent message and awareness of the Negro folk songs and its style, the spiritual. Let's talk about part one, the events of the Old Testament. The first song is, I'll Make Me a Man. When I enrolled to study vocal music at the University of the District of Columbia, the curriculum was structured so that students will have the ability to sing in various languages, styles, and techniques. In particular, one of the techniques used in many operas is called a recitative, an Italian style of singing used in operas and oratorios. It is considered speech singing with dramatic inserts of melodic chord structures. Likewise, in this particular song, the framework was set up to begin as a recitative. Once the music begins, there is an ostinato groove found in the bass line that drives throughout the song with syncopated rhythms in the upper part of the accompaniment. Uniquely, this composition tells a vivid story from the creation sermon from James Weldon Johnson's book of poems called God's Trombones. After reviewing this song over and over, I later found inspiration to create a musical dialogue between the voice, the piano, and the percussion. This next song is called Little David, Play on Your Harp. This soothing arrangement puts a smile on my face and it's very pleasant to hear. The story of David is by far one of the most well-known and highly requested biblical characters to date. Kudos to the piano arrangement for this composition. <laughs> this concept of playing on a harp without an actual harp? Wow! What a remarkable display in this composition. I can totally envision little David playing on his lyre and dancing around for King Saul. <laughs> Such a delightful spiritual. This next song, Dry Bones. This song is one of my favorite selections in this collection. The piano accompaniment's frequent melodic and meter changes really build personality to this arrangement. I was most excited to add imitations to the percussion instruments, creating a bone-like sound in order to paint a picture of the bones coming to life and walking around. <laughs> Although the message is profound, it is simply understood. This song is not only a fun arrangement, but I'm pretty sure that it appeals to both children and enthusiasts of the spirituals. The next song, Didn't My Lord Deliver Daniel? Roland Hayes describes in his interpretation of this song that there was an apparent hopeful character with a feeling of poignant longing. However, I chose to focus more on the observance of God's deliverance in order to answer that question. Did he or did he not 
deliver? The answer is celebrated in the percussions as a vibrant yes. In the next song called A Witness. A Witness is probably one of the top most popular spirituals found in this collection. Appropriately, this is the perfect follow-up song that reinforces the almighty power of God found in the previous song. Continually, the question that convicts the heart. The singer can also attest to the fact that God is a very present help in the time of trouble. Therefore, he admonishes all who would listen to consider these biblical characters in order to certify or validate God's existence. Ultimately, based on these stories, the charismatic messenger pinnacles with a challenging question that implores you and everyone to become a witness. In this next section, part two, is the abstractions from the teachings of both the Old and the New Testaments. This first song is called, Your Tired Child. Roland Hayes dedicated this song to his mother because he claimed that while he was mourning, he had envisioned a host of angels greeting his mother and it reminded him of this particular arrangement. He knew that she had worked hard for most of her life. Roland Hayes and the host of angels suggested that she should simply take a moment to sit down and rest a while before celebrating her crossover into the promised land. <laughs> However, once she realized that she had made it, she couldn't sit down because she was so overjoyed and full of renewed energy, she couldn't sit down. In addition to this wonderful piano accompaniment, the added percussion in order to showcase the excitement that she felt at her crossover is captivating. The next song is called Plenty Good Room. This spiritual is in the same caliber as the other popular spirituals such as Steal Away, Deep River, A Witness, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. You see, these spirituals are not to be looked at as some depression song, but rather a sense of hope in order to celebrate the coming of the promise. This is to say that the city of heaven is inclusive, but only to those who have been faithful. There's plenty of good. This next song is called Two Wings. Roland Hay suggested that this song be approached lightly as a tiptoe and as if you are reaching for something that's not quite within reach. However, I place heavy attention to the lyrics and in doing so, my approach is like a petition or great desire. You see, life can sometimes be overwhelming. Therefore, I want two wings to fly away. Lord, meet me. Take this burden or give me a way out. The next song is called Heaven. The piano arrangement is genius for this song. Imagine, if you will, the lyrics are removed from this song and you're listening to only the music. I envision that the character in this song would be in a daydream and dancing around. The anticipation of having new clothes, as in the robe, permission to enter, as in the shoes or access, and a celebration, the new song. The new song as you enter the promised land. All of this is incorporated in the accompaniment and the song lyrics. I hope you were able to make note of how the word heaven is sung in this arrangement. In many of the Hispanic cultures, the letter V is pronounced as a B. So likewise, I chose to replace the V and use the B in its place so that the word heaven or 
have been, <laughs> with an extended N on the end, has a deliciousness in its dreamlike state of mind. This next song is very special and unique. Steal Away. While I was studying voice with Charlotte Harleman, she shared with me that this song should be approached with a German S, just as you would if you were singing the Christmas version of Silent Night in German, Stille Nacht. The S would be approached as a sh. Reluctant at first, <laughs> but then I gave it some thought. And when I tried it, to my surprise, the idea actually turned out to be quite effective and it serves as a great word painting. The construction of this song originated at a secret gathering place with a whisper. This is to say that one needed to be quiet. Shh. In order to steal away. Therefore, my interpretation is to begin the song as the origin story, a spoken whisper. Steal away. Followed by the singing of the word steal away. And at the end of the song, it was intentional for a play on the word long <laughs> and for cutting off the anticipated last words of the phrase I ain't got long to stay in order to show that the character in this song has finally departed these last two selections in this section were actually the first two selections assigned to me in addition to Little Boy by my voice teacher Nelda Orman because of her, these songs are special and dear to me. You must come in by and through the lamp. I enjoyed the interpretation mentioned by Roland Hayes to say that God was perceived as a fourth dimension. In the first dimension, you can't go over God. In the second dimension, you can't go under God. In the third dimension, you can't go around God. Only one procedure is made in order to get to God. You can only go through the Lamb. Round About the Mountain. This particular song was carefully arranged and dramatized with percussion in order to share the vivid story that originated at the recession for the young woman who had passed away. As her family and friends traveled up and down the Appalachian Mountain, they memorialized and celebrated the fact that God showed mercy and delivered her just before her death. Prospectively, in this context, the word she can also be viewed as God's church. Therefore, the church, his people, were all once sinners. But the message declares that the Lord was merciful to the sinners, and because of his love and mercy, his church shall rise. Here we are in part three, the life of Christ. This section is from the song cycle, The Life of Christ, and it's chronicled to share the gradual happenings of Jesus' life experience. The first song is called Prepare Me One Body. This spiritual reminds me of three specific scriptures that reveal God's action plan to make things better. My first memorized scripture, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
the second was Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Jesus took the form of a servant to be like man and then to die for us. The third one, John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than to give his life for someone else. In this song, Prepare Me One Body, God chose in this likeness to make things right. The next song is called Little Boy. Well, it is rumored that this was the signature song for Roland Hayes. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed the dramatic piano accompaniment. This song is arranged and interpreted to showcase the shock and amazement from the lawyers, doctors, and religious scholars, and finally, the authority that Jesus had, even as a little boy. The next song is called Live a Humble. Professor Charlotte Holloman suggested that this song should be approached as a calling on your life, with an urgent message. In this case, the message is about your obedience, opposed to the timid approach that is often misunderstood about humility. The next song is called Hear the Lambs a Crying. The Hebraic minor mode arrangement in this song is a remarkable interpretation of the drama presented here. The message speaks for itself. If you see or hear a problem, let the love in your heart do something about it. But in this context, Christ says, If you love me, feed my sheep. This also shows that when God calls you in your unworthiness, or even when you're faced with overbearing oppositions, he's actually rooting for you. So this last section is part four, the passion of our Lord. Modeled after the art song format, Hayes created the Life of Christ song cycle. For this production, I divided panel three into two separate sections, making four parts into the songbook, omitting only four songs from this cycle. The first one is called, They Led My Lord The somberness of this song reminds me of a suspense movie soundtrack. The concept for the vocal arrangement is to give off the idea of not wanting any harm to happen to your loved one and the desire to see your loved one just one more time before their tragic end. The second song is called, He Never Said a Mumberlin Word. Just as Hayes stated in his review, this song is a masterwork and one of the most difficult songs I've recorded for this project. However difficult, yet in a live setting, it is also one of the most powerful and most compelling spirituals to touch and move an audience unlike any other spiritual you've heard in this collection. Were you there? Not to be taken literally, (laughs) but rather a perspective to ponder in order to recall an event that took place. The idea of a modulation in this song is to show progress as an emotional response based on these profound questions. Imagine this dialogue with both Mary and Mary Magdalene. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? All the heads are low and the eyes are shut and full of tears. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? All heads are slightly raised and their eyes are opened and amazed by this wonder. Were you there when God raised him up from the tomb? All heads and eyes are lifted up to the sky in adoration. No, we were not there physically, 
But if you were to ponder on these questions, it is likely that you'll be able to visualize these historic accounts, the crucifixion, and the powerful effect his death had on the world that the everlasting sun refused to shine. And finally, the resurrection to be raised from the dead without any human or man-made assistance, making him the true Messiah. This section ends with a song called, Did You Hear When Jesus Rose? One of the primary reasons I chose to conclude this production with this song is simply because of the chronological historic accounts and because it best concludes the previous song. The life of Christ began with his birth, his short lifespan, his death, and finally, his resurrection. Therefore, in order to authenticate this story, I felt it was necessary to end this production with added percussions in order to respond to this question and to celebrate his resurrection. My vision and mission for this project as a whole, this production incorporates resourceful narrations, imagination, creativity, and a profound awareness of the richness and sacredness of these treasured songs. All of these beloved arrangements in this collection include Hayes's personal mission, testimony, and personal references, all comprised with specific people and places. It was as if Hayes felt that he was called to be a messenger. His influence not only left an impression with African Americans and their recital programs, but for all aspiring classical singers, including singer Marian Anderson, who cited Hayes as an inspiration to her. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said this about Roland Hayes. Roland Hayes rose up to be one of the world's great singers and carried his melodious voice into the palaces and mansions of kings and queens. In conclusion, this project proved to be a fascinating challenge as I endeavored to recreate what I imagined to be the vocal qualities of Hayes' prime tenor days in order to maintain the vision for this project. Moreover, what makes this project so groundbreaking is the fact that out of all of the Roland Hayes' concerts and recital tours, there's no record or program of Hayes performing all of the spirituals in concert or recital from this book. The only documented program of Hayes' performing the spirituals is from his song cycle, which are included in this book, The Life of Christ. I imagine that this concert recital of all spirituals was something that he would have eventually done. So I'm privileged and devoted to the idea of presenting these song selections for all listeners. It is my hope that these selections will be as powerful of an experience for you as it has been for me, and that you will come away with a greater appreciation for the artistry and legacy of Roland Hayes and his collection a favorite spirituals. And God walked around And God looked around On all that he had made his son he looked at his moon and his little stars he looked on his world and with all its living things and God said I'm lost Still, 
God sat down on the side of a hill. God sat down where he could think. God sat down by a deep wide river. God sat down with his head in his hands. God thought and thought till he thought, Oh, make me a man. Up from the bed of the river, God scooped up the clay. And by the bank of the river, God kneeled him down. And then, this great God Almighty, who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky, who flung stars to the far most corners of the night who rounded the earth in the hollow of his hand this great God this great God like a mammy bending over her babe kneeling down in the dust toiling over the slump of clay till he shaped it he shaped it Till he shaped it in his own image Then into it he blew the breath of life And man became a living soul Amen Connected with the hip bone, the 
The hip bone connected with the backbone. The backbone connected with the shoulder bone. The shoulder bone connected to the neck bone. The neck bone connected with the head bone. Rise and hear the word of the
just like you I went down in the valley And I prayed till I come through Your hypocrite, your concubine Your place among the swine Your God, a God with your lips and tongue But you'll leave your heart behind The Lord loves the sinner The Lord loves the sinner man. The Lord loves the sinner And shall rise in His arms Round about the mountain Round about mountain my God's ruling and shall rise in his arms going around the mountain that's where I take a my stand I heard the voice of Jesus thank God he's in this land The Lord loves the sinner The Lord loves the sinner man. The Lord loves the sinner And show Jim, did you hear when Jesus rose? Did you hear when Jesus rose? Jim, did you hear when Jesus rose? Did you hear when Jesus rose? Did you hear when Jesus rose? He rose and ascended on high. When Mary set her table, in spite of all her foes, King Jesus sat at the center place and the cups did overflow. Children, did you hear when Jesus rose? Did you hear when Jesus rose? Did you hear when Jesus rose? He rose and ascended on high. The Father looked at the Son and smiled. The Son did look at Him. The Father saved my soul from hell. And the Son freed me from sin. Children, did you hear when Jesus rose? Did you hear when Jesus rose?